Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the All Things Fulfilled broadcast. This is William Bell, and in just a few minutes, we'll be underway with our lesson. I want to invite you to tune in every Saturday from 6.30 until 7 p.m. Central Time, from 7.30 until 8 p.m. Eastern Time for the All Things Fulfilled broadcast presented to you by the Rains Road Church of Christ. We are looking at lesson number three in this series of lessons uh, before, actually, this is part three of the messages that we started on um, departing or depart from me into everlasting fire. So this is going to be the third in that series, and maybe we'll finish it today. I'm not sure. At any rate, um, we encourage you to visit our website at All Things Fulfill and also our YouTube channel, which is where all of these uh, recordings are uploaded. So if you want to go back and look at them, you can do so at All Things Fulfill on YouTube. Uh, we have a book um, site that you can check out, which is allthingsfulfilled.com forward slash shop. And we'll leave some, <clears throat> some links down in the chat area so that you have access to those. Now, uh, in our last message on the part from me into the everlasting fire, we talked about the text that we found in Isaiah chapter 66, verses 15 and 16, and also verse 24. And we looked at the uh, worm that does not die and the corpses that they would look upon. And the talked a little bit about the unquenchable fire. We looked at Mark 9, 43 through 48, and uh, spoke about that as well. And we tied all of that into the coming of the Lord in connection with the end of the age in Matthew chapter 13, uh, verses 39 through 43. All of that was a reference to the kingdom in that age, which was the age of Moses. Now, today, we're going to pick up and tie that in with the subject in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34 and other passages in Matthew 25. So we're showing you how all of this relates together in the same context. And therefore, uh, all of it is demonstrating the same subject matter. Now, inheriting the kingdom in Matthew chapter 25 and the verse is 34. So we want to read that, get that text in front of you, and let you see what the Bible is saying regarding it. Matthew 25, and the verse is 34. Jesus said, or yes, then the king will say to those, at least this is um, the recording, then the king um, will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, remember when we were talking from Mark 9, 43 through 48, and maybe particularly in verse 47, uh, we mentioned the fact that he said, it is better for you to enter into the kingdom with one eye than to have two eyes cast into the Gehenna fire. So the whole point was entering the kingdom. The time for that entering the kingdom was at the end of the age because the Bible says, then shall the righteous shine in the kingdom, uh, or shine as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And that came at the end of the age, the age of Moses, in which they had Moses and the prophets, uh, as stated in uh, Matthew 13 and um, elsewhere. From that point, we come now to Matthew 25, which is yet speaking about entering the kingdom at the time of the coming of the Lord. Now, what's interesting, even before we uh, get into the point, is that Matthew uses three parables to talk about the kingdom from the perspective of the coming of the Lord, his second appearing, his parousia. And he uses the parable of the ten virgins. He talks about the parable of the man who takes a journey. And then he speaks of the parable of the sheep and the goat. All of those are kingdom parables that demonstrate the time of judgment 
or a separation between the righteous and the wicked at the time of the parousia or the presence, the coming of the Lord. Now, Luke only mentions one text in his account of the Olivet Discourse. And Luke places that kingdom text within the first century generation. Luke 21, verse 31 says, So likewise you, when you see all these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God has drawn near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place or are fulfilled. So that tells you that the kingdom parables that are used in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 34, actually beginning in verse 31, when he talks about the Son of Man sitting upon the throne of his glory, and then going into those other passages relating to the time of the end, must all be at the end of the age. Because Luke says it in Luke 21, 31 and 32. Matthew says it in Matthew 13, 39 through 43. And now we have it here in Matthew 25. So my point is Matthew 25 cannot be speaking of the kingdom in the end of a different age than the age of Moses. They're all the same age, and that's important for us to understand. Now, that being true, we also should understand that Matthew 24 discusses the same point because the text that Jesus is quoting in Matthew chapter 13 that we looked at in the previous lesson, part two of this uh, segment on Depart From Me into the um, Age Lasting Fire, Matthew 13, with the parable of the tares, is quoting Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. Now, let's take a look at Daniel 12 and notice the context and what you will see in Daniel 12 is a combination of Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 in the very same context within just a few verses. So let's notice that. In Daniel 12, let's begin at verse 1. He says, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble. The great tribulation, basically, is what that is. Such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. And by the way, that statement, everyone who is found written in the book, ties this together with Revelation chapter 20. Because everyone who was not found written in the book was cast into the lake of fire. And we'll have some comments on that as well. So notice everything that's being placed here or tied together in these verses. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time, the word uh, chronos is oh, Kairos, excuse me, is used here in every one of these time references in the passage. Your people shall be delivered. So he's talking about the appointed time. And many of those, now see, you can't disconnect verse 2 from verse 1. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to age lasting life. Isn't that the context of Matthew 25, verse 34? And following, verse 46. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to age lasting life, some to shame and age lasting contempt, or to age lasting reproach and shame if you want to get the order of the context. But that's what he's saying. Now watch. Here's the other text in Matthew 13. 
those who are wise shall shine. Isn't that what verse 43 says in Matthew 13? Then shall the righteous shine in the, like the sun in the kingdom of their father or as the sun. And those, uh, so they will shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Now, he tells Daniel to shut up the words and seal the book until, watch this now, the time of the end. So everything he's saying here is for the time of the end. And that, Matthew says, was the end of the age, the consummation of the age. That's the age of Moses. That's what the Bible calls the time of the end. Now, when we turn to Matthew 24, Jesus cites the text in verse 21 in connection with the flight from Jerusalem and the region of Judea, etc. When they see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place where it ought not. And what does the Lord say? As spoken of by the prophet Daniel, whosoever reads, let him understand. So. Then he says in verse 21, in connection with that event, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. So Jesus quotes Daniel 12 and verse 1, right smack dab in the middle of Matthew 24, in verse 21, and says that's the time. When the great tribulation would occur, that appointed time, used four times in verse 1, and then what does he say in verse 2? And at that time, or and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. So what Jesus did is he connected the resurrection, which, by the way, is connected to the coming of the Lord, because Paul quotes Daniel 12. In 2 Timothy 4, 1, when he says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is about to judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So he's put the kingdom, the appearing of the Lord, the judgment, and the resurrection all in the same text at the same time, and it was imminent in the first century. So this is what we're dealing with here. But Daniel says, this is when many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to age lasting life and some to age lasting reproach and shame or shame and contempt. Now, when we therefore look at Matthew 25, we will see then that Matthew 25 is also quoting from Daniel chapter 12. That means that the events of Matthew 25 and Matthew 24 are one single event in terms of the time of the end, and therefore Matthew 24, 34 governs not only the verses preceding it, but also the verses following, because all of that was within the first century generation. That spells doom for the futurists, and it just shows you that you cannot divide Matthew 24 because it's all coming out of Daniel when he says, at that time, your people shall be delivered. And that's what he called the time of the end. Now, what does he say in this context? Verse 34 again. In Matthew 25, which is a quote from Daniel chapter 12, the text says, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, we remember we showed from Mark 9 that the kingdom and age lasting life are one and the same. And you could also check that again in Daniel chapter 7, because Daniel chapter 7 says in verse 27, um, the kingdom and the dominion 
and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting or age-lasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So there you have this correlation between Daniel 7 and Daniel 12. And you could even throw Daniel 9 into the mix just for good measure, which says that all of these things would take place within the 70 weeks. Those weeks of jubilee that found their fulfillment in the time of the abomination of desolation and the war that happened in 70 AD. So it's all there. It all correlates. It's all consistent and therefore referring to one and the same. Now, if this is the case that they enter into the kingdom and the kingdom is life, so what's the opposite of life as we discussed before? The opposite of life is death. And that would mean that to fail to enter the kingdom, to fall short of entering the kingdom, as many of the rebellious ones did, that would suggest that not entering the kingdom is death. But that's what Mark called entering into the fire that is never quenched. It's death. It's age-lasting death. So let's look in verse 41. In verse 41, the text says, after speaking of those that were um, visited and fed and um, given drink, etc., treating their brothers correctly, in verse 41, he says, then he will say to those, or also to those on the left hand, so he's spoken to the sheep, now he speaks to the goats, the hard-headed ones. Then he will say, also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So where does he tell them? One group, the sheep, he says, enter the kingdom, but the kingdom is life. The other group, he says, enter the everlasting fire, but the opposite of life is death. So he's telling them to enter into this age-lasting death. That's the simplicity of it. He didn't tell them to go into this eternal burning flame of hell. Remember Thessalonians? They were to be destroyed from the presence of the Lord with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. This is the kingdom, the life being taken from them and given to another nation. They had it in promise and prophecy, but that's taken away from them when the reality of that or the fulfillment of that came and given to another nation who would bring forth the fruits of it. And he tells them the reasons why, the very opposite of, you know, their behavior was just the opposite of what the sheep did. So everlasting fire here, or age lasting fire just simply means the opposite of life, the opposite of entering into the kingdom. It is not about dying and going to hell. Did some people die? Yes, many of them did. But a lot of these people were still living at the time. And yet the Bible says that's where they went. Why? Because that's a metaphor for their destruction, for their complete casting away from the presence of God. And if you don't think that's punishment, I want you to understand the importance of being in the presence of God, having God's face to smile on you, and then having that favor to turn away from you. Moses understood it. If you don't get anything else, Moses understood it. Because when Israel sinned with the golden calf, According to Exodus 32, Moses interceded on their behalf when God was saying, look, I'll wipe them all out, Moses, and I will begin a whole new nation with you only and raise up a whole other nation of Israel from that. And Moses said, if you do that, God, what are the people of these other nations going to say? They're going to say you can't deliver. So he prayed, interceded on behalf of his brethren, even the ones who were in sin. And there was Aaron, his flesh and blood brother. 
caught up in the mess. And God says, my presence will go with you. Now, they were in the wilderness where everybody was crying, bickering, complaining that we're going to die here. We're wanting the leeks, the onion, the garlic, and the flesh pots to the full that we had in Egypt, the melons, etc., the cucumbers. But they were crying and murmuring and complaining every day, oh, that we would have died in the land of Egypt. Why did you bring us out here in the desert? We could have died with our bellies full. But God told Moses, my presence shall go with you. Here's Moses' response against the backdrop of all that murmuring and complaining. He says, if your presence does not go with us, then do not take us out of this wilderness. He might have said me. I haven't looked at the text in a moment. But he says, if your presence doesn't go with us, then don't take us out. Moses understood that heaven was truly, that the true land of Canaan was God himself. That's what he understood. And if God is not there, there's your hell. There's your separation. The most important thing to him was a relationship with God. It didn't matter where he was on the physical planet. And even in death, it's being in the presence of God. And that's something that we need to learn to appreciate. Now, with that being the case, in Matthew 25, we have to look now in verse 46, Matthew 25 and verse 46. And by the way, on this unquenchable fire, if we look in Jeremiah chapter 7 and the verse is 17, the text says, but if you will not heed me, now he's talking to Israel at the time that they're being threatened with Babylonian captivity. He says, but if you will not heed me to hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Hmm. I wonder where that unquenchable fire is in Jerusalem today. Do you think those people who are living over there are there because they are in the midst of unquenchable fire? That there's a literal hell burning in Jerusalem now? But the Bible called it a fire that could not be quenched. You see, that just meant a punishment that could not be averted. And once God did it, it remained, the results remained. The Jerusalem that existed in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, no longer exists. It was destroyed. Now, yes, they rebuilt the city, but they rebuilt it from the ruins on top of the one that was destroyed. So we're not to think of that as an eternal or fiery burning hell. It just means a total destruction that could not be averted and the results of which were permanent. So now let's look at Matthew 25 and verse 46 in the remaining time that we have. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into age-lasting life. You see, the same contrast with the kingdom in verse 34 and with the everlasting fire in verse 41. The righteous go into, or, or rather the wicked go into Age lasting punishment from the presence of the Lord, and the righteous go into age lasting life or the kingdom of God. The cutting off simply means to cut short, um, to prune a cutting down, which was a very familiar meaning in the time of Christ. It's from the word colossus or colazzo, and Example uses of it are found in Acts 4.21, where the text says, so when they had further 
threaten them, they let them go, finding no way as how they might colossen them, if you please, punish them. Well, was the Sanhedrin going to send the apostles to hell and to eternal burning fire? Is that what that text meant? No. It just means to punish because of the people for all glorified God for that which was done. And again, we have it in 1 John 4 and verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. He who fears has not been perfected in love. The word torment is the same word Colossian used in Matthew chapter 25. And the scripture says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. Is that everlasting, eternally burning fire? No, but it's the same word that's used there. And it just is spoken of those who are not in the love of God. And those who fear. But Jesus says the fearful have no right in the kingdom. Revelation chapter 22, verse 15. Now, Jesus' teaching, therefore, combines and compares with Daniel 12, 2. And we're out of time, but we're going to come back and we're going to um, look at that in our next message. And we'll tie some other points in together with that from the book of Revelation. And then we'll wrap up this depart from me into the everlasting fire. So I hope you enjoyed the message today. I hope you got something beneficial from it. Uh, check out our book, Will Planet Earth Be Destroyed? You can go to our website, allthingsfulfilled.com forward slash shop, or you can pick it up on Amazon. I'll leave a link in the uh, chat along with some other uh, links as well. With that, I want to say thank you for watching. I'm William Bell. We'll see you next week at the same time. May God bless and keep you.